Welcome to Under the Big Top with Henry Nowen. I'm your host, Karen Pascal, and tonight you're going to meet some very special friends of Henry's. You're going to meet film director Bart Gavigan, and you're going to meet trapeze artist Rodley Stevens from Australia, and you're also going to meet writer Carolyn Whitney Brown. And you're going to see scenes from the film Angels Over the Net. They've never been seen before by audiences around the world. It's a very special night. Those film clips contain amazing insights from Henry about how the trapeze and the spiritual life come together. You're in for a treat. Now let's get started. We're heading to Vancouver Island in British Columbia. I want you to meet Carolyn Whitney Brown, the author of this wonderful new book called Flying, Falling, Catching, an unlikely story of finding freedom. On the cover, it says, by Henry J.M. Nowen and Carolyn Whitney Brown. <laughs> Carolyn, how did you write a book with Henry Nowen when he's been dead for 26 years? <laughs> well, it is true. It's difficult to have a, a dead co-author. But I knew Henry, and I knew him quite well. And what he left was really fascinating. So working with the archives and working especially with Rodley Stevens' own memoir, I could feel Henry's experience from the inside and also get a, get a sense of what it was like to know Henry from the outside in those years in the circus. So that is how the book came together. It's fascinating. It's an amazing book. It really is something special. I, I'm hoping that everyone listening has uh, either got a copy already or is going to be enticed to get a copy after they hear a little bit more about the story. How is this book different from other books that Henry Nowen wrote? Well, the thing about this book is that it's a story. Henry had an experience. I don't know whether, whether you listening have ever had an experience like this that is so physical and so compelling that you don't have words for it, but you have a huge physical, emotional response. Maybe it takes you back to another time in your life. And Henry had an experience like that watching this Flying Rodley's Trapeze Troupe perform. And so what he wanted to do was write a book about an experience and he wanted to write a different kind of book. He wanted to write a story to give readers the experience, not not his thoughts about it, but an experience. So he wanted it to read like a novel. He wanted to write creative nonfiction. So this book honors that desire of Henry's and takes the pieces that he tried to write in this other style and weave it into a book that's in two voices, Henry's and mine. It has two typefaces. You can see what's Henry's writing and what's mine to tell this story of an experience, a physical experience. Maybe you need to tell us when is this story set? Is it is it just set in the circus or where does it begin and, and what is the framing of it? So on September 16th, 1996, Henry was in Holland on his way to Russia. He was going to film a film about the um, return of the prodigal son painting in front of the actual painting. And he got off the plane and he went to his hotel in the Netherlands en route and he started to feel terrible and he called down to the front desk and they sent paramedics who determined he was having a heart attack and that it was so serious that they didn't dare take him down the elevator, they didn't dare take him down the stairs, they took him out a window. And, and, and that just captivated me, Henry's flight, he flew out a window. Uh, so the book is set, framed by that experience, that that the book is framed, the whole book takes place um, really in probably 15 minutes. On that day, September 16th, 1996, when the paramedics come and my fictional framing that it's not fiction that he got taken out a window, that's all true, everything's true except that I have him look back over his life and think about why he didn't write the book about the Flying Rodleys and what he'd wanted to write and what in his life came together that, that made him interested in them. So he is reflecting back over his life while he's taken out a window during a heart attack. I know that I was absolutely amazed at the book you have created out of this. We felt like we handled, handed you bits and pieces. Yes, Henry had done some notes. He, he was fascinated by the Rodleys. He was following them for five or six years. And there was he was preparing for a book. 
And people need to understand that it took him about 10 years before he really wrote the book about the return of the prodigal son based on Rembrandt's painting. He was musing about this book. He was gathering his thoughts. But we weren't sure there was a book there. And I remember just inviting you into what I thought might be a bit of a mess to say, you know, do you see a book here? And it, it was pretty exciting, Carolyn, that you could delve into this and find um, such substance and, and, and really create this narrative, which is absolutely fascinating. Well, as I was saying earlier, I couldn't have done it without Rodley Stevens' memoir. And Rodley's just a beautiful human being. You'll meet him later in this webinar. And he wrote a memoir and he starts out by saying that the experience they had of Henry was that Henry was fun. That, that Henry was a delight to be with. And he starts out uh, his own memoir. So my book too starts with Rodley's memory of being at Henry's funeral and hearing people talking about Henry's anguish and, and, and how demanding he was. And Rodley's uh, sense that, that, wow, that their experience of him was fun. And that really spoke to me because I knew Henry and I too had experienced him as anguished and a very demanding friend sometimes, but also so much fun. And so that to me grabbed, grabbed a kind of heart of the book. Henry was fun. Rodley and the trapeze artists experienced him as fun. Henry's own experience that trapeze touched into the longings and deep, deep desires in him and also a sense of relaxation and delight. So part of shaping the book was trying to have fun writing it, uh, to create a book that would be fun to read, that would read like fiction, even though it's true, that would introduce Henry to readers who've never heard of him because he's such an interesting character, to just tell a good story, knowing that a good story will find readers. Well done. Well done, Carolyn. A good story does find readers for sure. Why don't you read a little bit from the book? Why don't you... Uh, Maybe around, uh, I think, page 10. Why don't you share a little bit of the book with us? I think we'd like to hear okay. how you've woven this story together. Great. I would love to do that. Here's the book if you haven't seen it. It looks like this. So what we have here is um, the paramedics have arrived. And Henry is thinking that the paramedics arriving in this heart attack is an interruption. It says he has mixed feelings. There have been many interruptions in his life. Some of them have turned out well. Five years earlier, Henry was in Freiburg, Germany, working on a book when he first saw the Flying Rodleys perform their trapeze act. It left him breathless, almost in tears, as a sudden bodily rush of adolescent infatuation swept over him. He was already 59 years old, so he'd not expected to be so stirred when he went to the circus with his elderly father. At first, he'd assumed that his sensations were anxiety because the act looked dangerous. It was only later that he recognized his own physical excitement. His response had been so dramatic that he repeatedly struggled to put words around it. And now this, are, this is Henry's own words. What really got to me, what really fascinated me was the trapeze artists, and that's why I became so involved in the circus. And when I saw them at the very beginning, it was absolutely fascinating. This was a group of five trapeze artists, four of them people from South Africa and one an American. I was just so impressed by this group that I kept thinking about them. They did incredible things in the air and somehow, and that was important that I realized that, that has always been why I went to the circus. It was never for the animals and never really for the clowns, but what I was always waiting for and what really grabbed me was the trapeze artists. And these guys were really amazing. Actually, they weren't all guys. There were three men and two women. And I was just fascinated by the way they were moving freely in the air and making these incredible jumps and catching each other. And I was just fascinated by their physical prowess. But I was as much fascinated by the group as a team, the way they worked together, because I realized there must be enormous intimacy among these people. 
when everything is so dependent on cooperation, when everything is so dependent on mutual trust, and everything is dependent on exact timing. I realized from the very beginning that this group has to be really well together. And I saw that they enjoyed it. They, they really had fun doing it. And there was a kind of excitement in them that became very contagious for me. It was a kind of, wow, you know, and I, I must confess that when I saw them, they seemed to be in a way like gods so far that I, I wouldn't even dare come close to them. I had this emotional response that these people are really so far above me in their talent or their giftedness. They're such great artists. Who am I, a little tiny guy wanting to get to know them? Carol, and that's a beautiful taste of this book and a beautiful introduction to where we're going to go next. I bet you want to see the Flying Rodleys, and that's exactly what you're going to see. And you're going to hear from Bart Gavigan, the director of Angels Over the Net. When I saw the Rodleys for the first time, I said, I missed my vocation. <laughs> I should have become a, a flyer. On the other hand, my body is as left and, and unpractical and handy as possible. But interiorly, spiritually, I realized I always have liked to be a flyer. And, uh, and it's been an enormous joy for me to, to gradually discover what's all involved, you know, and to, to, to discover what the art of the trapeze really is. It's much more than a show. It's much more than just a little act. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture of life. When I, when I tell to people, I'm thinking about writing a book about a trapeze, most people think I'm talking about a trappist. You know, they think, oh, you go write another book about monks? I said, no, the trapeze. They said, the trapeze? What, what the, you say, you mean the circus? I said, yeah, 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 the circus, the trapeze. to know the trapeze life from, from within. I, I came to know how Rodley and his wife and his sister and his friends were relating to each other. I came to know the danger of what they were doing. I came to know how complicated everything is that is around this, this one act, setting up the rigging, preparing, uh, the, the costumes, uh, uh, the sound, the music, all, you know, this one little act was a whole life. And, and what happened in these 10 minutes was really the result of a life of work, a life of thinking, a life of commitment, a life of enthusiasm, a life of working. And, and, and this, 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 this really absolutely fascinated me. I just wanted to, to, to grab it from the inside. I asked Bart Gavigan, the director of Angels Over the Net, to give us some insights into the making of this film. Instead of shooting the film over three months, two months, seven months. We shot it over four days, uh, four very, very intensive days where the Flying Rodleys were headlining in the Ahoy Arena in Rotterdam. And they were twice a day giving performances to 6,000 families, you know, adults, children. And this was the whole context of the film. <laughs> So 
So in this film, from the very outset, this collision, the whole world collides, everything collides. The classical cello rude, is rudely interrupted by a circus band, a raucous circus band, or the list of Henry's august institutions where he's taught at collides with the, the kind of organized chaos of, a, of the circus world. In the film, he's mainly watching and looking and responding and ooing and eyeing in, in, in lots of ways. And then he, he digs into himself to comment and so on. And that static approach means that in a spiritual, emotional and psychological way, Henry has to be forming triples and double layouts and saltos uh, coming from his mind and his soul, not his body, but which are every bit as gripping and challenging and spectacular as the flying that's taking place above him. Yes, I have been teaching theology at many, many universities, but, uh, but in fact, this, this act is, is telling more about theology than many, many books. And they summarize theology for me in a, in a, in a remarkable way. And in a way, uh, the, the, the Rodleys never would say that of themselves, but they became sort of theology teachers for me, you know what I mean? They talked about what life really is about, what really is important. In your walk through life, is this your biggest discovery? Well, it's, it comes at the moment that it is a really new discovery, you know. First, I, I, I taught, I loved to teach in universities. And then I, 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 was, I felt I missed something, something of the heart. And so I, I discovered the life of handicapped people. And it was a real discovery. And the handicapped people became also my teachers, the teachers of the heart. And in then, way? in a way that while they can speak, while they cannot explain, they, they tell me something. They tell me that being is more important than doing. They tell me the heart is more important than the mind. They tell me that community is more important than doing things alone. All these, these great, valuable truths, they, these handicapped people taught me without any words. And then a few, later, a few years later, you know, when I, I met the Ratleys and, and I saw their work and I got to know the trapeze world, something, again, something really new happened. It was suddenly as if I discovered the incredible message that the body can give. You know, it's like university was the mind, uh, life was about the heart, but, but the trapeze was about the body. And the body tells a spiritual story. The body is not just body, it's, uh, it's an expression of, 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 the, of the spirit of the human person. And the real spiritual life is an enfleshed life. That's why I believe in the incarnation, that God becomes flesh. God enters into the flesh, into the body. So if you touch a body, in a way, you touch the divine life. There is no divine life outside the body because God decided to dress himself in a body or to, to become body. In the clip we've just seen, Henry talks about his journey from his head to his heart and then on to his body, the journey to his body. And it's probably the, my favorite clip of the whole film. Um, I, lo I love how he speaks about the incarnation. That's something we talked about for a long, long time. And there's another special reason that I love this clip, and that is that it almost never happened. So on the night before we were to film it, uh, we were going through the next day's shooting as usual, and that would seem like a very unusual process to people who aren't used to it. And we would study huge white sheets of paper, like flip charts, and go through them and make, uh, I'd done the condensation of what Henry was going to talk about, and he would study that. And it, it's really to do with the nature of film, where you don't want great pauses between people talking. You want them to know in their head what they're roughly going to say. So we're going through all that, and we got to the chart where it was talking about the journey to the body. And um, I thought it was totally normal until suddenly Henry had a kind of panic and a sort of meltdown, really, uh, right before me, almost like a, a panic attack. And it, I, I didn't quite understand at first. Uh, after all, we'd been talking about the journey to the body for about 10 years. And in a way, what had happened was that the, with the Rodleys, 
that took a new focus and a new energy inside Henry. It, 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 he really it clarified and things became transparent in a new way for him about that. So this was the core of, of what was Henry was going to say the next day. And suddenly he, he was just frozen and talking saying, I, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I can't, I can't. My family will be deeply shocked and my, my upset. My father, my two brothers. <laughs> and at first I wanted to laugh and then I realized, no, no, he's, this is really happening. He, he's seriously panicked. So I, I just listened uh, a long time. We just listened, listened as he talked and it was like, seeing him slowly come down from a ledge <laughs> that he was up on. Um, and then finally he just laughed out loud and he said, um, oh, it's just lovely. He said, this is completely ridiculous. You know, um, of course I must talk about this. It's the thing I really want to talk about tomorrow. It's the one most, one of the most important things that I want to share with people. And it was just like the moment passed, the, the emergency passed. Um, and I, I understand it. I, it's a very intimate thing where he's talking about the incarnation and how the enfleshed, how we experience God in flesh. And, it's a, and really talks about it very, very beautifully. So we prayed and there was a genuine resolution and I left and went to bed. And I felt peace, completely at peace. I didn't think there'd be a an emergency phone call in the middle of the night and having to rehash it all and so on. But it's one of the reasons why that clip is so really beautiful for me, because as I say, it almost never happened. So what was Henry's response to the film? He was just delighted with this film. He loved the film. He felt that he it said the things that he, really wanted to share and wanted to say. He loved the flying, he loved the way that had been captured and so on. And the, the thing that he was really excited about, he felt that this film was the art, piece of art for him, where it did what his books had never done, he felt. It crossed over to potentially to a secular audience. And um, that who he was, the stories he wanted to tell, the world of these two worlds colliding. He just felt at peace that um, this great crossover to the secular audience could take place. And it gave me great joy that Henry thought this film would last long after both of us. Now I would like you to meet a very special guest. Coming to us all the way from Australia, Rodley Stevens. He was the founder and the creative force behind the Flying Rodleys. And this was the trapeze troupe that Henry Nowen met and became the most ardent fan of. Welcome, uh, Rodley. It's lovely that you would join us tonight. It's a pleasure being here with you. And of course, chatting about Henry is a, a, a great friend of ours. Thank you for inviting me. Rodley, tell me, how was it that you came to know Henry? I think the story is quite fascinating. Um, my team, the Flying Rodleys, were um, contracted to uh, the circus in Germany called Circus Barum. And um, we'd been there for a year. By the time we got to the town of Freiburg, which is in the south of Germany, uh, coincidentally, Henry was doing a sabbatical at a publisher there, uh, translating one of his books into German. And he had with him his father um, visiting um, uh, at that week. And um, the, um, his publisher or his host suggested that um, for something interesting to do that night, they'll go and see the circus, because the circus was in town. And um, I was performing with my team uh, in the circus show that he saw that night. And um, he was so taken with our, with our show that um, he, he returned the next night and asked the circus owner, Mr. Gat Seminite, if he could meet the flying trapeze team. Uh, it just so happened that my sister, Carleen, was buying an ice cream at the front of the um, circus tent at the time, and um, he, he spotted Carleen and he sent Henry over 
to um, say hello to Colleen, and Colleen is a very, very friendly per person, and she welcomed him and said, hi, oh, if you want to meet the team, why don't you come in to, to the backstage area um, during the intermission, because we would have just finished the Flying Trapeze Act, and I can introduce you to the team at that time. And so after the performance, um, we pulled down the net and we did all of our safety securing and um, got backstage. And we always do a little chat after each, um, each act to sort of ex to speak about what, what happened, what went wrong, what went well, how everybody was feeling. And um, uh, when we got into this meeting, there was a strange person standing there, a very tall, gangly guy with very thick glasses. And um, Carlin introduced him as Henry now, and, and I said, okay, okay. So I said, well, we're going to talk about the, um, the Flying Act. And he said, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. And um, uh, as we started talking, he got more and more cl closer to us, and he started to kind of look into our faces. And um, I said, um, excuse me, what are you doing? And he says, well, I, can I cannot hear you very well, so I need to see your lips. I need to and, and are you speaking English? What language are you talking? And so we all just started laughing, and that was really the way Henry came into our hearts and into our troops, is that he was just so almost childlike in his enthusiasm in about learning something new and so inquisitive, um, yet he was not at all shy to actually tell us how he felt and what he needed to know. And um, so he said, well, I'll answer all of your questions afterwards, and um, later on he said, uh, when you were talking, you were using words that I'm not familiar with. So I said, unfortunately, a lot of that is trapeze jargon or what, whatever um, we talk about, and some of it will not be familiar to you because it's all about flying trapeze and all about our work. Um, so I said, how will I get to know this? So I said, well, you'll have to come and see us practice tomorrow, and then we can talk more about it. Um, at that time, I could hear the music changing, and the second half of the show was going to start, and and um, I, I said to him, you should go back and watch the show. He said, oh, no, 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 I, I've seen the show already. I don't, I don't need to see the next act. I want to speak with you. So we ended up walking all the way down to my caravan um, and, uh, and chatting with him. And um, that was the beginning of a really um, long friendship with Henry, which um, sadly finished uh, six years later. I know that he, he loved what he was seeing. What do you think caught his imagination? Well, he said to me once that um, his work at La Arche at Daybreak was um, all about um, connecting with people who cannot speak, and um, and he said we're in the same in the same way when we were performing, he connected with us, yet we didn't speak to him. He said your movements made the connection with him, the 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 dance we did in the air or the the um, painting we were painting in the air with the big top tent as our backdrop that was talking to him. And um, he felt moved by what he saw. I know that it meant the world to him, but I also know that he was getting profound lessons from what you were teaching, from what you were doing. He was seeing the possibility of it being applied somehow in his life, but also perhaps in a, in a book that he would create. We're so grateful that uh, Carolyn Whitney Brown has written Flying, Falling, Catching uh, because she's captured so much material in that that's really exciting and really of worth. And much of it was material that you shared. You took time to write about that friendship with Henry and uh, it, it is an important uh, revelation, I think, really, of of who Henry was and and why he became so enchanted with the trapeze. You actually took him up and had him try it out. Tell me about that. I, I know there's scenes of it. Yes, um, what we did, uh, from time to time, we'd, uh, when we practiced, we'll take some of our friends or members of um, the family or guests up for uh, a swing on the trapeze. Um, and um, I offered that to Henry. I said, would you like to have a swing on the trapeze one day? He said, oh, yes, he'd love to try it out just to have that sensation in his body. He said he's he, uh, from a young boy already when he was in his early teens, he'd seen a circus show and he was attracted to the flying trapeze and thinking that if he was more physically able, he would be able to do flying trapeze or he'd like to try it. And now I could finally um, make that, uh, turn that into a reality for him. And so we did get him up on the flying trapeze one day and I put him in the safety harness and um, I had one of my catchers holding the safety lines on the ground 
and I went up on the platform with him just to calm him down because first of all, just getting up there is quite scary. You know, when you look at the platform from the ground, it doesn't seem very high, but once you're up on the platform looking down, especially to someone that's not a trapeze artist, it can look, it's very daunting, very scary. But Henry was so casual up there, he, he'd just be turning around and not even holding on. It was almost like he just trusted that he was not going to fall. And, um, and I'd be saying to him, oh, Henry, just, just hold on for there, you know, hold on to that for a minute and whatever. So um, the hardest thing was actually getting Henry to get off the platform. He got his hands on the trapeze bar and he just kind of stood there and said, I said, now, Henry, you have to take your feet off the platform. And he couldn't move his legs. He was holding on with his hands. And I think he was so focused on holding on for dear life that he, he couldn't move his legs. So I physically picked him up and pushed his feet off the platform so that his feet were clear. And then I dropped him so he could swing. And he had a lovely swing and he enjoyed it. I, you could just see his face was very, sort of had a lot of concern in the beginning, but after just the one or two swings, he was smiling broadly and really enjoying the sensation of swinging and flying, I suppose. So uh, he wrote quite um, a lot about that in his journals. And um, uh, I think that that was a very important uh, experience for him. On another occasion, uh, I think it was one of the last times that Henry actually came to visit with us, um, uh, I had him go up and hang with the catcher. Now, um, that means that you have that hand-to-hand -hand grip with your catcher in, um, in the catching position. And the, basically what he did was um, he hung there and he just kicked his feet forward and backwards from time to time. And he... Uh, he just enjoyed being being held. He liked to be held. He liked to have that feeling and the safety of somebody gripping and holding him. And he, he did speak about that. He said oh, he felt really safe. Um, he didn't feel in control. And I suppose in a way that makes you feel safer. If, you, if you're hanging under somebody and you feel that they've got you so safely or so tightly, you don't feel like you're going to drop any minute and, and fall. So that was another experience that um, I think he really enjoyed having. And he spoke about it as well. And, and that connection that he, he made between the fly and the catcher, the trust that develops between the fly and the catcher, knowing that you can only fly safely, put your hands out there and allow the catcher to catch you. I think it's probably the one of the most profound things that comes out of that whole experience. It, it's it's amazing. Tell me, um, you were part of making Angels Over the Net. The film was focused on you folks. Tell me a little bit about that experience, Angels Over the Net, and the the uh, film that was shot. Uh, a few um, times after Henry had visited us, um, he decided that he was going to um, rent a camper van and tour on the circus with us for a month during the summer. And Henry wanted to write about all of those things. He was determined to get to know us. He was determined to share our story with the world. And then an opportunity came where a Dutch television team, run, uh, the producer Jan van den Bosch, um, asked Henry to do a documentary, which was a follow-up documentary to one that he had done one or two years previous to that in his home country at Hol in Holland. And um, he said, I'd really like that you do the documentary on the Flying Rodleys. And of course, this was completely out of the left field. Uh, it was not the type of documentary that Henry was used to doing or expected to do. But I think it, he was so determined to share it with us that they caved in and they said, okay, we'll do this. And so um, the year was 1994, it was December of 1994, and we just happened to get a contract at the Ahoy Halle, which is the, uh, it used to be a big velodrome in the city of Rotterdam in Holland. And um, we started filming, and they got a lot of footage of us in the flying act, which is really what Henry wanted. And um, we spent quite a bit of time being interviewed on camera with Henry and very, very thankful to not only Henry for um, uh, showing us to a, a completely different audience, 
but also to Bart Gavigan for showing us in a very positive light. Oh, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful film. People are going to enjoy seeing it. We we have we were able to share some of the highlights from it, and uh, and I'm so grateful to have the chance to chat with you. One last question: I am very excited about the book by Carolyn Whitney Brown, and I know you've been part of this this flying, falling, catching, and there's lots of lots of contribution that's come from you. Tell me just a little bit about how you feel about this book. Fortunately, at that time, I used to keep a very accurate diary, and I'd just go back in my diary, and I could get it to the day exactly when Henry would arrive and when he'd leave and what, what happened at that time. I also had a diary of our flying trapeze performances, and I could see when we failed, and I could see when we succeeded and things like that, and I also used to have a, a video diary as well, and, and I basically got all of that together and collated a little document which turned into a small book, which I called um, What a Friend We Have in Henry. Um, and that became um, the document that I sent to Sue, and which finally found its way into all the material that um, Carolyn Whitney Brown uh, managed to use in the book that's become Flying, Falling and Catching. And it's such an honor for us to be included, in my words, to be included in those pages because we, we did have a very special relationship with Henry. And the relationship that we had with him was really him being our friend, but him getting something from us that he wasn't getting anywhere else at the time. When Henry came to us, we allowed him to be himself. We, we did not have any demands on him. We didn't ask him to, to pray for somebody for us. We didn't ask him to, to be a father figure for us. We didn't ask him to be anyone other than a friend. And he filled that position perfectly. He used to lounge around. We, uh, you know, we have pictures of him arriving uh, to the circus and he'd go into the caravans. He'd, he'd love to sit in the different caravans and he'd have a special spot in each one. And he'd just lounge there as if he just long, he, he, he was like a cat sitting very comfortably in its favorite cushion. And he'd have a cup of tea there and he'd be chatting away. And it was just a way that we remembered Henry that um, we don't believe he, he wasn't like that anywhere else. But it seemed like he, his life was very, very demanding in all the other places where he lived. And um, I think the thing with Henry was that he was so interested in us personally. He wasn't just, oh, he's the catcher, or she's the flyer, or she's the sister, or you know, he's the partner. It was, you the person to me. You are important to me. And I suppose in that way, it was easy for us to see that Henry was important to us. And we didn't know it, how important that he was to us until we heard about his passing. And it was uh, very sad, actually, for us. And um, <clears throat> like we had done this um, a few times before uh, in our lives, um, just before we went on to perform in the evening show that night, I said to the team, I said, this one's for Henry. <laughs> This was for our friend that we miss. I hope you like it, Henry. And that was our life for Henry. I think it was wonderful. We called it Angels Over the Neck because I think he watched over you after that. I do believe he loved it. I do believe he loved it. Yeah, we we did miss him for many weeks afterwards. It was... Um, uh, it was good closure going to the funeral. It was um, it helped us get on with our lives and uh, once again try to focus on on what we needed to do. Um, as it turned out, uh, we've ended up uh, living in Australia now, but um, it doesn't take us any further away from our memories. And it was really wonderful when Carolyn made um, contact with me and said, um, "I'm writing. I'm finally writing about Henry, and I'm writing the book that he promised to write about you." And uh, we want to use all of your material in that. And I, of course, gave her permission to use all that material. And it was really wonderful feeling like I was collaborating with Henry again. And, um, and I really hope that book gets read by a lot of people because it really is about our true friendship with um, a wonderful person 
and friend um, that we uh, that we made, and we just thank Henry for being our friend and for actually taking the time and making the effort to come and meet us backstage that first day and saying, "Who are you? I want to know who you are," and not asking us to be anything more than just his friend. Oh, I love that. That teaches us all so much. Thank you, Rodley. Thank you so much for all that you've shared. It's just rich with uh, the kindness and generosity of friendship that existed between you and Henry and Henry and the entire troop. And it's a real lesson to all of us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate it so much. It's a pleasure, Karen. Yeah. Thank you. Carolyn, I really hope people have their appetites whetted to go out and get this book. I think it's wonderful. Flying, falling, catching, an unlikely story of finding freedom. Now, I'm curious, that subtitle, an unlikely story of finding freedom, why did you choose that? You know, the last five years of Henry's life had a lot of growing for Henry. A lot of changes in his life where he stretched out into a lot of new areas, new communities, and did find and was on his way to finding new kinds of freedom. And the trapeze artists and the trapeze act really spoke to that in him. The, um, in fact, one of the things, I'm just gonna read a wonderful thing he said that's uh, at the beginning of the book about the trapeze act. He says, the 10 minutes that followed somehow gave me a glimpse of a world that had eluded me so far, a world of discipline and freedom, diversity and harmony, risk and safety, individuality and community, and most of all, flying and catching. That there was something, and he says it over and over in the book, the idea of flying, the idea of flying th freely through the air, but not alone, in community where someone's gonna catch you, the freedom to invite someone to fly and catch them, that that, that physical aerial flying freedom just touched him profoundly. This beautiful book is available as a book, as an ebook, and also as an audio book. We're planning to feature Flying, Falling, Catching in our online Advent book discussion, which begins November 23rd. We hope you'll join us for this uh, online community gathering. It's led by Ray Glennon, one of our board members. Before we part, Carolyn, would you please read to us from the epilogue of your book? Yeah, well, it's special to do that today on the anniversary of Henry's death because of course I was a member of his community of L'Arche Daybreak when he died. So this now actually gives my own voice the I and this is me. News of Henry's death reached the Flying Rodleys after their last show that evening. They had expected to see him after his trip to Russia. They sat for a long time quietly remembering their friend and the next morning their grief weighed down their practice. But at their afternoon show, after they bounded into the ring swirling their sparkling capes, Rodley made a short speech dedicating that performance to the memory of their friend Henry, and they performed flawlessly in his honor. During the final bow, Rodley looked at the seat where Henry had last sat watching them, wishing the person sitting there was Henry. At the funeral in the Netherlands four days later, Rodley and Jenny again had the experience of being welcomed like old friends by people they'd never met. They already knew Henry's family, and Rodley was moved when Henry's brother, Laurent, insisted that Rodley replace him as a pallbearer. Once again, I'm supporting Henry's weight in my hands, but this time not on the other end of a safety harness, thought Rodley. He and Jenny sat weeping through the funeral service. And Rodley fought back his urge to leap up to tell the assembled mourners their experience of a different Henry. Relaxed, curious, a little flamboyant, attentive, hilarious, fun. Thus there were two funerals, one in Utrecht that Rodley and Jenny Stevens attended, and then another in Canada that gathered more than a thousand people. Henry's body flew across the ocean in a beautiful classic coffin of honey, natural oak. By the time Henry's body arrived in Canada, there were also two caskets. 
Years earlier, Henry told the Larsh Daybreak Woodworking Program that he wanted us to make him a casket when he died. During the long week, as we waited for Henry's return with his family, I invited community members to draw and paint their feelings. Artwork flooded in, full of life and color, and I used it to create a colorful hand-painted lid, painted in a radiant rainbow. Our work of collaborative art looked like a door. At the funeral home near daybreak, we moved Henry's body into our homemade rectangular pine casket. His brother Lawrence and I gently tugged off his necktie to mark that he'd finished traveling and brought him home to daybreak. Wow. Carolyn, I want to thank you so much for being with us. And again, I, I encourage people be sure and get flying, falling, catching. You'll love it. I also want to thank Bart Gavigan in England. And I want to thank Rodley Stevens in Australia. And I want to thank someone very special who you did not get to meet tonight, but who contributed richly to this evening's event. That was Jan Vandenbosch in the Netherlands. Jan allowed us to use the beautiful scenes that he shot at Larsh Daybreak. And angels over the net and that was a rich contribution to this special event of under the big top with henry now and now angels over the net is going to be available as a full film before this year is over we'll keep you posted on that because i'm sure you're going to want to see it now before we close i would like to read something which henry now wrote you were the beloved before you were born and you'll be beloved after you die that's the truth of your identity. That's who you are, whether you feel bad or not bad, or whatever the world makes you think or experience. You belong to God from eternity to eternity. Life is just an interruption of eternity, just a little opportunity for a few years to say, I love you too. We're going to close with one final word from Henry now and one final scene from Angels Over the Net. Thank you for being with us tonight. Everybody always thinks that the great hero of the trapeze is the flyer. And I'm a flyer, he said. And I make all these saltos and these triples and do all these spectacular things. And people applaud for me and they think I'm great, 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 great. But you know, he says the real hero is the catcher. I can only fly freely when I know there is a catcher to catch me. When I know that when I come back from my trip, there is someone to grab me. That's what life is all about. We like to take risks. We like to be free in the air in life. But we have to know there's a catcher. We have to know that when we come down from it all, we're going to be caught and we're going to be safe. And the great hero is the least visible. And I tell often that little story. And I tell you every time again, Afterwards, people say, trust the catcher. <laughs> Henry, trust the catcher. <laughs> Isn't that true? And, and recently, I had, it was a funeral, a friend of mine who died, and it was very, 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 very painful. And it was in Ottawa, and I, I was asked to give the homily, the, the sermon. And on the end, they told this story. And it was amazing that the person whose husband had died said to me, Henry, Thank you for talking to me about the catcher. That's what life is all about. And I know my husband trusted the catcher. <laughs>